Hello everybody, my name's Jeremy Agnew. I'm the host of the Grim Dark History Podcast, where we explore the intersection between history and popular fiction. Right now, we're in the middle of a multi-part series on somebody who has been in a lot of popular fiction, and that is Alexander the Great. If this is your first time tuning in, you might want to go back and listen to the first episode in our series... Episode 1 in our series, we covered the background and history of Greece and Persia leading up to the assassination of Philip, that's Alexander's father. In episode 2 of the series, we explored something tangential to the history of Alexander the Great, but no less important to him, and that is the religious experience of participating in and what a Greek sacrifice would have looked and felt and sounded like. In episode three of our series, we explored the initial phases of Alexander's invasion of Persia. We explored his consolidation of power after the assassination of Philip, putting down the Thracian revolt, putting down the Greek revolt, the destruction and and enslavement of the city of Thebes, his initial invasion covering Anatolia, the siege of Tyr, the surrender of Jerusalem. In this episode, we are going to be covering Alexander's conquest of Egypt, Babylon, exploring his time and place there, exploring slavery in Alexander's army, Alexander's own perception of slavery. We'll explore the Persian Empire. We'll explore the destruction of Persepolis, the Persian government and recent palace coups that happened, and we'll be exploring Alexander's conquest of Persia right up to the death of Bessus. So keep listening. Thank you very much. This I know this is a very long series. I'm trying my best to try and keep this down to around the hour mark, and I think this episode um, makes that. So if this is something that you like, if the episode length is something that you like, please feel free to reach out on me. I'm on uh, Twitter at Grimdark History. You can find me on Instagram at GrimdarkPod. I'm also on YouTube. That's YouTube slash at grimdark history so please feel free to reach out to me on any of those channels and if you're an email person you can also just email me by emailing grimdarkhistory at gmail.com and uh, enjoy the show and thank you very much for listening I'd like to talk now about Alexander and his relationship with divinity and divine forces. I've teased it a little bit, little tidbits here and there over the last several episodes. We talked about Alexander's mother, Olympias, and her dream of being impregnated by Zeus, or at least visited by Zeus, prior to her consummating her marriage with Philip. that might hang a question mark over Alexander's true father. I talked a little bit about the religious experience in the second episode, and, and I've touched a little bit about this in the third episode, but I haven't really dug into it. It's been in the background, little tidbits here and there. I think it's time now to start digging in to Alexander and his relationship with religion and the various gods in the world. After Alexander uh, finishes off, pardon me, after Alexander finishes off the city of Tyr, and he's uh, accepted the surrender of Jerusalem. I didn't mention he's already fought another major battle against the Persian army. He's actually defeated the king of Persia in battle. 
This is called the Battle of Issus, if you want to look that up. Alexander happens to come across the Persian army as they're hunting each other, and they're in favorable grounds for Alexander's army to attack an army that's much bigger than him, and he attacks and he wins, no surprise. But after he's defeated the Persian king at Issus, he has control over basically all of Mesopotamia and the Levant. He's got access to the Persian treasury. He's at now the most more wealth than he has ever seen in his entire life and more wealth than probably any Greek with him has ever seen as well. Now, he'd like to keep hunting down the Persian king. He hasn't yet caught him yet. So there's still up in the air the question of who's the definitive king. You know, there's the du jour king and the de facto king. Mesopotamia, the Levant, Syria, Anatolia... All of these places recognize Andrew, or pardon me, Alexander as king. But he's not officially king. He's not recognized king by the Persians yet. So there's still that hanging in Alexander's mind. But he's still dealing with the Persian navy, pestering the Greek colonies in the background. And he's got to finish mopping up all the... Uh, Persian port cities. So as Alexander marches down to the Levant, closing off the port cities, accepting surrender, sieging towns and cities, he moves into Egypt, which is the breadbasket and one of the most wealthiest lands in the Persian Empire. This is where Alexander builds the city of Alexandria. He builds the lighthouse at Alexandria, the what's called the Pharos. But while he's there, he decides to visit the Siwa Oasis. Now, the Siwa Oasis is not easy to get to. There is an oracle there called the Oracle to Zeus Amon. You have to cross the desert to get to it. Um, and uh, crossing the desert's not easy when you're a uh, one man or you know a small uh, band with a guide with you. But Alexander takes a significant chunk of his army with him. And uh, in the, in the few hundred years in the past, when the Persians were trying to invade Egypt, they hadn't yet conquered Egypt. The Persian king Cambyses lost. Uh, about 20,000 soldiers, give or take, so the story just go, you know, people exaggerate numbers. But he lost about 20,000 soldiers trying to cross the desert to get to Siwa. So Alexander is lucky when he crosses the desert. Um, it happens to coincide with the right time of year that there's been some rains. So the winds aren't blowing sand dunes around. The water or the rains have kind of dampened down the ground, made it easier for armies to pass. Supposedly some ravens guide his army so that nobody gets lost going through the desert. But as he gets to the Siwa Oasis and to the temple of Zeus Amon, Alexander uh, and his generals meet the oracle. And the oracle has this to say, quote, Having passed through the wilderness, they came to the place where the high priest, at the first salutation, bade Alexander welcome from his father, Amon. And being asked by him whether any of his father's murderers had escaped punishment, he charged him to speak with more respect, since his was not a mortal father. Then Alexander, changing his expression, desired to know of him if any of those who murdered Philip were yet unpunished. And further concerning dominion, whether the empire of the world was reserved for him. This the god answered, 
he should obtain, and that Philip's death was folly revenged, which gave him so much satisfaction that he made splendid offerings to Jupiter, and gave the priests very rich presents. This is what most authors write concerning the oracles. But Alexander, in a letter to his mother, tells her that there were some secret answers, which at only his return he would communicate to her only. Others say that the priest, desirous as a piece of courtesy to address him in Greek, said, O Padion, by a slip in pronunciation ended with the S instead of the N, and said, O Padios, which mistake Alexander was well enough pleased with, and it went for current that the oracle had called him so. Just to dissect what I was I just read to you there. This was from The Life of Alexander the Great by Plutarch. And what Plutarch is telling us is that when Alexander visited the uh, oracle at Zeusamon, the oracle greeted him as, O child of God. That is what Opedios means. O child of God or O child of Zeus would be the way it would have been interpreted by the Greeks then. And O Pedios means child, O child of Zeus. O Pedion, which is what they maybe think he was trying to say. O Pedion is Greek for O my son. So you can see there's a situation here that might be uh, an Egyptian priest, not fully familiar with the Greek language, and desiring to impress Alexander, or at least ingratiate himself to him by showing that he can speak the language of the new king of Egypt, tries to address Alexander in Greek, and instead of saying, O Pedion, O my son, you know, welcome to the temple, he says, O Pedios, O child of Zeus, welcome to my temple. So here is a little uh, tidbit of information that can take one way or the other. Was it a priest who uh, would just, you know, all his life he speaks Egyptian and suddenly a new Greek king comes to arrive to him and now he uh, tries to brush off his Greek for the few Greek travelers he gets to the oasis and this is an oasis that Greek travelers would seek out so that's why he does speak Greek already amongst other things they trade with Greeks for and have for hundreds of years but uh, you can see somebody who doesn't maybe isn't used to speaking Greek um, you know, constantly, certainly you can see an easy situation of saying Ope Dios instead of Ope Dion. That's an easy thing to get messed up. An N instead of an S, S instead of an N. But this is part of the myth and legend and story of Alexander the Great. Did the... Um, Oracle intentionally address Alexander as a child of Zeus? Or was it accidental? You can take it one way or the other. I'm not here to settle one story over another. But this is part of Alexander's story. Growing on this story, though, aside from the potential slip-up of Oh My Son versus Oh Child of Zeus is the confirmation to Alexander of what he would want to hear. If you remember when my um, previous episode, I opened with the story of the Gordian Knot, also from the life of Alexander the Great by Plutarch, that um, the person who undid the knot would be reserved dominion over the world. And here that pops up again asking the oracle will i have dominion over the world and then being confirmed as such now it's very easy to see that this is plutarch 
being somebody who's trying to tell you an entertaining story. A good history back then should teach moral lessons, but it should also be entertaining. And here we have the theme of somebody who is destined to have dominion over the world. This theme repeated several times, hinted at, you know, the Zeus visiting uh, Olympias in her bed prior to the marriage or the consummation of the marriage. Alexander undoing the Gordian knot, his mother telling Alexander of his divinity. I didn't tell you the story of Alexander visiting the Oracle of Delphi prior to his invasion of Greece. That's when he's mopping up the city-state rebellions. Alexander, in that story, drags the Oracle to the temple because it's a religious holiday and the temple's not open. And the Oracle, of course, tells Alexander what he wants to hear. What would you think? What would you do if the person who just, you know, slaughtered the entire city of Thebes is dragging you by your hair to the temple? That's not somebody you mess around with or want to displease. So Alexander has been reinforced multiple times, or at least in the story of the life of Alexander the Great by Plutarch. This theme of Alexander having dominion of the world and having divine right to have that dominion, being fated to have that dominion, repeating from the oracle of Delphi, from his mother, from the story of the Gordian knot, and again from the oracle at Zeus Amman in the Siwa Oasis. Now another author uh, mentioned by Plutarch is a uh, another person called Samon, who's a philosopher. Samon kind of retells this story a little bit that, um, you know, Alexander, and again, quoting Plutarch here, carried himself very haughtily to the barbarians as if he were fully persuaded of his divine birth and parentage, but to the Grecians more moderately and with less affectation of divinity, except it were once in writing to the Athenians about Samos when he tells him that he should not himself has bestowed upon him that free and glorious city. You received it, he says, from the bounty of him who at the time was called my lord and father, meaning Philip. However, afterwards, being wounded with an arrow and feeling much pain, Alexander turned to those about him and told them, this, my friends, is real flowing blood, not ichor. This is, of course, another common part or another common way that people view Alexander. Playing up his divinity to the people who worshipped him as a god. The Babylonians, which I'm going to get to shortly here, but the Egyptians, since while we're here. Of course, the Egyptians worshipped all their kings as gods, representatives of the gods on earth. Alexander is getting his first real taste of this type of divine worship as he's in Egypt and visiting the Siwa Oasis, uh, getting the official rubber stamp of approval by somebody who is a direct intermediary, even kind of above the high priest. This is the oracle that even the priests would go and visit to seek um, information about. This person's giving the rubber stamp that, yes, Alexander's a god. And, of course, Egyptians would acknowledge their king as a god. It's another way to think about that. The O Pedios, O Pedion, that I was talking about a few minutes ago, may not have been accidental. It may just be part of the culture of how Egyptians view their kings. If you're the king... You are the child of Zeus. And Alexander playing that up. Yes, yes, yeah, of course, of course I'm God. Of course I'm the child of Zeus. 
you should see me that way. You know, grease the wheels of government, get the population in line. That's a very easy thing to see somebody doing. Especially if it gets the population doing what you want without objecting. No revolts. Getting everybody in line, that sort of thing. And then to his uh, Greek allies and friends. No, no, I'm not king. No, you know I'm not a divine uh, person. Of course not. Of course not. I'm not divine. And then later on the story when he's wounded by an arrow and he holds up his hand covered in blood and he shows them that I am most certainly not a god. This is an Ikor running in my veins. Ikor being the divine um, juices or blood or whatever it is you would call it that's inside a god. Alexander pointing out that he is most definitely not a god. And I'm not trying to say in my story here the ascension of Alexander that Alexander thinks he's a god. I'm telling another story here and I'm going to get to that uh, uh, towards the end of our series. What I'm trying to get at. But this is an interesting little thing about Alexander's um, visit to the Siwa Oasis, at least as described by Plutarch in the book Lives. I mentioned as one of my sources um, Anabasis of Alexander by Orion. I haven't really quoted it um, so much uh, right now or up till now. I have kind of talked uh, or pulled tidbits out of it in the background, but haven't really drawn any direct quotes. I thought since we're talking specifically about um, the Siwa Oasis, I thought we might take a look at the Anabasis of Alexander and what Orion has to tell us about Alexander's trip to the Siwa Oasis. Orion tells us that the quoting Orion now. The priests of Amon convey quantities of it into Egypt. For wherever they set out for Egypt, they put into little boxes plated out of palm and carry it as a present to the king or some other great man. The grains of this salt are large, some of them being even longer than three fingers breadth, and it is clear like crystal. The Egyptians and others who are respectful to the deity use this salt in their sacrifices, as it is clearer than that which is procured from the sea. Alexander then was struck with wonder at the place, and consulted the oracle of the god. Having heard what was agreeable to his wishes, as he himself said, he set out onto the journey back to Egypt by the same route, according to the statement of Aristobulus. You can see here that Orion's um, story of Alexander's trip to the Siwa Oasis was decidedly uh, less sexy, less mystical, less driven for um, divine forces than Plutarch's account. You might say Orion was much more grounded in potential reality. Orion is telling us that Alexander the Great visits Siwa because there is a salt mine there that has salt crystals so pure that they're clear like glass and that the crystals have grown so big that they're basically about four inches thick and still perfectly clear as grass. The priests at the temple control this mine. They dig up the, you know, the salt that's there. They put it in gift boxes. They use it as part of their uh, sacrifices as offerings to the gods, but also gift it to the king of Egypt. And you can see Alexander as he conquered Egypt and moves in and probably receives from a emissary from the Siwa Oasis a box containing these salt crystals, which would probably look like magic to him. And Alexander being fascinated by all things new and interesting would 
want to make a trip to the Siwa Oasis to see this salt mine for himself. And while he's there, he visits the Oracle, but you can see the uh, statement or story of what was said there at the Oracle was decidedly uh, drawl and gray. Orion, as I mentioned earlier, you know, when I was talking about my sources, is generally considered a very solid and realistic account of Alexander's story. I mentioned one of my sources as being seen as sketchy. If you aren't sure about who that is, it's Plutarch and the book Lives. That's the one I have been quoting from because I'm trying to tell a little bit of an interesting story of color here. And again, I know the story's sketchy. And this is, um, I know we're telling the story of Alexander the Great. But I've picked lives specifically for a very specific reason. And I promise you I will get to the reason why I'm quoting so heavily from lives instead of other books that are generally considered more grounded in reality and probably more accurate to the life of Alexander the Great. But I did want to pop in. What, what, are, what did Orion tell us about Alexander's trip to the Siwa Oasis before we move on? As Alexander leaves Egypt, he begins moving back up through the Levant, that's through Phoenicia, Tyre, Jerusalem, into Assyria. He's heading towards Babylon and Persia. And by now he's been at war against the Achaemenid Empire for three years. He spent one year taking Anatolia. He spent two years taking the Levant and spending that time in Egypt. And then, of course, it takes time to march an army out of Egypt all the way across the Levant through Assyria towards Babylon and at this point, Alexander is looking for a final definitive battle. He's been three years. He's already fought several major battles. He's successfully sieged several impenetrable cities. He's built and founded some cities of his own. And he runs into the Persian king, who, of course, has had time since Issus. He's had two years to build another army. And he goes to hunt down Alexander. And they have a battle uh, just between uh, Assyria and Babylon, kind of in the, the field there. You can look this up if you're interested. Again, it's called the Battle of Granicus, or pardon me, it's called the Battle of Gogamela. At Gagamela, he definitively defeats the Persian king again. And the Persian king uh, flees with a few thousand of his soldiers in the army that's left. The rest of the army is either killed, surrendered to Alexander, uh, and integrated into his own army, or they disperse. And then Alexander, as he's chasing down the Persian king, enters Babylon. And here he's probably seeing what um, one of the greatest cities in all of civilization looks like up until this point. Babylon is one of the wealthiest cities and areas, controls uh, major trade routes. It's an incredibly multicultural and diverse place because of all the trading that happens there. You know, next to Egypt, which is an incredibly wealthy place, Babylon is incredibly wealthy. And if you're interested in the history of Babylon, you can go back uh, just to my previous series to this called The Destruction of the Tower of Babylon. We cover about 1,700 years of the history of Babylon and Assyria right up to the uh, destruction of the Tower of Babylon by Assyrian King Sennacherib. But in Babylon, we have a couple of interesting stories. 
Alexander stops there for a time. In the Anabasis of Alexander, we're told Alexander takes part in the same religious rites that the Babylonian kings would have done. So he's uh, instructed and in how to perform a sacrifice to the god Marduk. At this point in time, he's called uh, Belus or Belus Marduk. It's one of those things, you know, 1700 years of religion evolves and changes. But he performs a sacrifice there to the, to the Babylonian god. An interesting story from Plutarch while Alexander is in Babylon is the Babylonians have access to something they call naphtha. Naphtha is a kind of unrefined kind of raw oil or some product of oil, kind of like a pitch or bitumen only liquidy, so it's probably more on the uh, oil side than the pitch side. The Greeks have never seen this before. Alexander is fascinated by it. The Babylonians, as they try to impress their new king, line the street of Babylon with it right up to Alexander's um, king, or palace. And as the sun begins to set, you know, the city darkens, kind of get the mood lighting right. One of the Babylonians at the opposite end of the street sets the oil line on fire. And you can, you know, see it in the movies all the time, the little path of fire shooting up the street, lighting oil along. Alexander is extremely fascinated by this. And Alexander explores the properties of this uh, flammable liquid that's fascinating him by setting one of his slaves on fire just to see if he'll burn. It's told that it's a Athenian who convinces Alexander to do this. And, you know, if you're an apologist for Alexander, you, you're going to latch on to it's the Athenian, not Alexander. But the reality is Alexander is king and Alexander is the one who agrees and sets a slave on fire just to see if he'll burn. If you wanted to do that and not harm a human being, you might, um, you know, set an animal on fire. I know that's cruel in its own right. But again, I just want to point this out because this is how Greeks saw their slaves. A lot of people like to think of Alexander as a uh, cultured and a generous person. And there are uh, elements of that, of course. But this is also Alexander as well. This is not a slave who defied him. This is not somebody who tried to assassinate Alexander. This is not somebody who insulted Alexander. This was somebody who was Alexander's entertainer. He was a singer for Alexander. And Alexander set him on fire just to see if he would burn. Speaking of slavery, we talked about, of course, how Alexander enslaved 30,000 Thebans. And how as Alexander uh, moves through Anatolia and the Levant and Mesopotamia, as he sieges cities, the ones that uh, don't surrender get sacked. We talked about what a sacking means. Of course, a lot of people get tortured, murdered, raped. The cities pillaged. They take slaves. Cities that surrender... Uh, probably still had to provide some form of tribute in the form of slaves and as well as other taxes. Just wouldn't have been the entire population. And we talked a little bit about, you know, Alexander setting his own slave on fire who was there to entertain him. Plutarch tells us that Alexander cared quite a bit about the state of slavery 
in Plutarch's example, he's trying to portray Alexander as having great care for his um, generals. But there's another thing to read about when we talk about these letters, and I'm just going to read them to you. Quoting Plutarch here, he gave order to search for a youth that belonged to Seleucus, who had run away into Cilicia. And in another thanked Possestus for apprehending Nikon, who was a servant of Craterus. And in one to Megabyzes concerning a slave that had taken sanctuary in a temple. These are letters that Plutarch's trying to tell us how he cares for his generals. But you can see the undertone here, the anxiety, the thing that's happening in the background is there are slaves whose life is so horrible they're running away from their masters. We've seen this many, many times. Romans, much like the um, U.S. South during the slavery area, had laws against runaway slaves, against people helping runaway slaves. There were people whose entire jobs and careers concerned uh, policing, capturing, and breaking slaves. The same thing existed in ancient Greece and existed in Alexander's army, and Alexander was thoroughly concerned about slaves that ran away from their masters, enough that he would divert from ruling a kingdom, an empire, as large as the Persian Empire was, he directed his attention towards helping his generals capture their runaway slaves. And there are several examples of this, uh, both in Anabasis and in uh, Plutarch's uh, The History of Alexander the Great, of what they did with their slaves. You can imagine, of course, there are servants. We had the example of the singer who was an entertainer for Alexander. There would have been slaves that bathed them, that fed them, that served them. You know, house servants, that type of thing. But you can imagine the darker part of slavery that everybody doesn't want to talk about. Sexual slavery, rape. That happened, too, in Alexander's army, and it was supported by Alexander. Philoxenus, one of Alexander's generals, had a side hustle, if you would call it, of selling uh, slaves. There's an example provided where he is selling two young boys of great beauty, and that's quoting um, Plutarch which Alexander does not shut down the slave trade. It's part of Greek life. And the horrors that these two young boys of great beauty would have, well, you can imagine. This is part of the story of Alexander, too, and it's something a lot of people who have um, kind of an odd fascination of Alexander's wonderful qualities like to ignore that this is another important quality specifically to Alexander. This was important to him. This was important enough to him that he would stop running his kingdom in order to help his generals capture their runaway slaves. After Alexander is done spending his time exploring the flammable properties of naphtha, he continues his pursuit of the Persian king and the remnants of his army, chasing them through Mesopotamia. This would be down through southeastern um, Iraq into Iran. This is where Persia is the heart of Persia, is in Iran. Passes through the Zagros Mountains where he conquers some more people, fights some more battles. And then he stops at Persepolis. This is in Persia. This is what Alexander and the Greeks think 
is the capital of the Persian Empire. They think Persepolis is the um, kind of main palace of the Persian kings. The reality is, in modern thought, is that Persepolis is actually a kind of um, picnic area for the king. The Greeks think it's a palace, but to the Persian kings, this is just like your summer cottage. And they, modern archaeologists believe this because they have um, excavated the ruins of Persepolis, and there are no kitchens there. That should tell you that the Persian kings, you know, this isn't a palace that you stay at. This is a place you stop and visit and then move on. You would have your kitchens with you. The Persian kings operated um, like their Persian ancestors do. They were a very mobile kingdom. The court of the king was always in motion. And Persepolis is a place visited during a specific time of year for the Persian Zoroastrian religion. And it's a place of gathering. But to the Greeks, this place is so grand, so far beyond anything they have ever seen, that they think this is the heart of the Persian kingdom, when it's really just the equivalent of a picnic stop for a, a religious rite for the Persian Empire. And Alexander burns the thing down to the ground for no particular reason. And I'm going to quote to you Anabasis by Orion. And remember I told you that Anabasis is considered to be the more realistic and grounded account of Alexander versus the two that I've been showing to you as we've been going through this, that being Plutarch's account and Orion's account. And quoting Orion in the Anabasis of Alexander, he burnt down the Persian palace, though Parmenio advised him to preserve it for many reasons, and especially because it was not well to destroy that which was now his property. And because the men of Asia would not by this course of action be induced to come over to him, thinking that he himself had decided not to retain the rule of Asia, but only to conquer it and depart. But Alexander said that he wished to take vengeance on the Persians in retaliation for their deeds in the invasion of Greece, when they razed Athens to the ground and burnt down the temples. He also desired to punish the Persians for all the other injuries they had done the Greeks. But Alexander does not seem to me to have acted on this occasion with prudence. Nor do I think that this was any retributive penalty at all on the ancient Persians. End quote. I want to pause here and talk a little bit about the Persian accounts or influences Alexander the Great had on Persian culture. Because there's a, at least what I was finding it, a bit of a, a love-hate yin-yang perception of Alexander, and I think it's a legitimate perception because that perception exists in Western culture as well. As I've been showing, the black and white, the good and bad of Alexander the Great, he's done a lot of horrible things, and he's also done some enlightened things. So um, no one person is all good or all bad. There's Lots of shades of gray, maybe even 50 of them. But the Persians obviously have a cultural memory of Alexander the Great as the destroyer of their empire. Alexander is not often referred to as Alexander the Great in Persian modern culture. He's often seen as Alexander the Destroyer. And I told you, tell, and I am telling you this now, 
because of course we just talked about Alexander destroying Persepolis for no particular reason other than he just wanted to watch it burn to the ground. Maybe he's still somewhat fascinated by the memory of his uh, slave boy that he set on fire with naphtha. Alexander the Destroyer is, of course, the one who destroys a religious center, Persepolis, one of the main important stops of the Persian kingdom, burned it down to the ground for no particular reason other than he just wanted to watch it burn. Of course, the reason he gives is vengeance on the Persians for burning down Athens. But if you were with me last episode, Alexander burnt down and razed the city of Thebes. That would have included the temples there as well and enslaved everybody. So Alexander would be a bit of a hypocrite to take vengeance on the Persians for burning down a city, enslaving its population and temples, when of course he's gone around and done exactly the same thing to the exact same people, the Greeks, the Grecians. There's hypocrisy and projection there, and I don't think we should shy away from that. But of course, as I said, there's a black and white, a yin and yang to the Persian relationship to Alexander. There is Alexander the Destroyer, which I just talked about for the last couple minutes here. But there is also Alexander the Enlightened King, and that is also a part of the Persian culture. There is an epic poem, one of the greatest works of literature in all of ancient and medieval history written at approximately 1,000 Common Era, so this would be uh, roughly 1,300 years after Alexander the Great, long after the psychological scar, the heat of recent history, long after that would have left the Persian people, and they may be looking uh, back on history through rose-tinted glasses, but the Persian poet Ferdowsi wrote this epic poem, again, one of the longest epic poems in all of history, re widely regarded as one of the greatest pieces of literature in its time. The poem is called the Shanama, or the Book of Kings, and apologies to any Persian speakers that are listening to this. I tried my best to uh, pronounce it as close as possible. But in the Shanama, Alexander has been rewritten, and he's been rewritten as having Persian royal blood in him. And this is done partly because of the Persian Zoroastrian religion. In the Persian Zoroastrian religion, only the royal line could be kings because only the royal line had divine descent in them. They were divinely ordained. So in the Shadama, a Persian epic poem, again written about 1300 years after Alexander the Great, Alexander is written as a, an enlightened king who has great care for his people. And he has been rewritten as having Persian royal blood in him. He's not fully Greek. But I just wanted to give a little aside here, a little tangent on a piece of Persian history, a piece of Persian literature that a lot of people don't realize exists. And it is widely recognized. Again, this isn't me just being hyperbolic as one of the greatest books of literature of epic poetry that's ever been published. I've been talking about Persia, how Persians thought of their kings, what was required to be acknowledged as a king by Persians, about their religion, about Persepolis, Alexander the Destroyer, 
I've been talking about that because we're going to spend the last few minutes in this episode talking about Persian kings, about the government of Persia leading up into the few years before Alexander started his invasion. Alexander invaded Anatolia in 334 before Common Era, four years before Alexander invades. If you were with me in my last episode, I told you there were a couple of coups in the royal palace. Well, four years before Alexander invades, the first such coup takes place. The king of Persia at that time is a king by the name of Artaxerxes III. He was murdered by one of the court eunuchs, a man by the name of Bagoas, and that name's going to come up again later. It's going to be a different Bagoas. I'll tell you when that comes up. But Bagoas is a eunuch, but of course, Bagoas, as I just told you a while ago, he is not of royal blood. So he's not divinely ordained, so there is no way in hell anybody would accept the rule of Bagoas. But Artaxerxes has some children. Bagoas kills most of Artaxerxes' um, children, leaving just the two youngest sons alive. Arces, who's the oldest of the last two children, he's put on the throne as a puppet king. But Arces tries to kill Bagoas, because, of course, what would you do if somebody killed your whole family and then said, do what I say or I'm going to kill you too? Well, Arces tries to kill Bagoas, the man who murdered his family, and he fails, and Bagoas kills Arces. So that's two regicides in just a couple of years. You can imagine the chaos that would be in the government. And Bagoas has a problem now because, um, well, he can't really put the youngest kid in charge. Well, the other one just tried to kill him. So Bagoas uses his control and influence and finds somebody else who's of royal blood, who would be acknowledged as legitimate, but who's weak enough that Bagoas believes he can control as another puppet king. And that is a man by the name of who becomes, he renames himself as Darius. This would be Darius III. Darius III comes to be king of all the Persian Empire. And the first thing Darius does is he manages to kill Bagoas. And he gets full control over the Persian government. But this would be only about two years before Alexander begins his invasion of the Persian Achaemenid Empire. So Alexander, by the time Alexander does begin his invasion, the Persian Empire has had effectively three palace coups, two by Bagoas, and one by Darius III, who is the king of Persia as Alexander begins his invasion. He's defeated twice by Alexander. Darius III is the head of the Persian armies at Issus and Golgamela. And this is the Persian king that Alexander has been chasing through southern Mesopotamia, through Persia, and as Darius runs for his life, Darius's kind of lieutenants try to take over the throne from him. They see Darius as too weak to lead. And so one of Darius's lieutenants tries to seize the throne from him, yet another palace coup. This is a Persian by the name of Bessus. Bessus kills Darius III and leaves him in the trail, and Alexander will uh, come up to him. He gets the body of Darius, and he sends it back to be buried as a king in the Persian manner. Bessus creates, I guess you would call it a remnant Persian empire, the areas that Bessus controls would be roughly equivalent to northeastern Iran, 
Afghanistan, Pakistan, parts of Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, and parts of India. He tries to create a kind of break off Persian Empire and fight off Alexander the Great. This would be effectively a Persian resistance army, but Alexander's pursuit is so fast, so hot on the heels, he does not give time for Bessus to consolidate any real control over these parts of the Persian Empire. And because Bessus himself is not of the Persian royal line, he has a lot of difficulty getting any sort of people to uh, line up around him. They see Alexander's army, who's already destroyed several Persian armies. The king, the legitimate king, is dead. And as Alexander is chasing down now Bessus, he actually runs into the legitimate heir to the Persian kingdom. This would be the youngest child of Artaxerxes III. This is a, a man, a young man by the name of Bestanes. He finds him while he's pursuing Darius in northern Iran, northern Persia. But despite Bessus's attempts to maintain some Persian resistance, the speed of Alexander's pursuit prevents any kind of fourth army from rallying around him. The lack of royal blood is Bessus's problem. The speed of Alexander's pursuit is Bessus's problem. And because he can't get any time to form an army, forge political alliances, consolidate control over remnant Persian people, instead the Persian Empire fractures. And all these people who were part of the Persian Empire either declare independence or submit to Alexander as he charges his army through. As Bessus's revolt, or not revolt, I guess resistance would be the better term, as the Persian resistance under Bessus falls apart or fails to manifest, Alexander finds himself under not only de jure, but also de facto control of the Persian Achaemenid Empire. Now, as I just said a moment ago, the empire fractures under Bessus. There are still huge chunks of the territory that have broken away, declared independence. And Alexander now has control of the wealthiest areas of land. He's controlled more land than any Greek king before him has ever done. The land that he does control is a lesser kingdom than even it was under Darius III. And certainly it's a lesser kingdom than it was under Cyrus the Great. But Alexander is now king of a fully conquered Persia. What's left is Afghanistan, Pakistan, Uzbekistan those areas going into one of the wealthiest areas of the world and an area of the world that has a close personal religious and spiritual connection to Greeks but also to Alexander specifically and that is India. In India is the home of Dionysus, the birthplace of Hercules, it was the place where Dionysus conquered huge chunks of land. It's the place where Dionysus earned his godhood. It's a place of wealth, a place of mystery, a place of divinity. It's the source of demigods. And it's right on Alexander's doorstep. And it's what we will be looking at in our next episode. This has been the Grimdark History Podcast. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show.